Great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm John Taylor. I am a therapist. I practice outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, my, my primary areas of focus are men who are struggling with sex addiction, um, men and their partners. I do a lot of couples therapy, um, helping to rebuild, um, helping to rebuild uh, relationships after violations of trust and um, betrayal. Uh, and like Tammy had just mentioned, I, I work a lot with uh, men who are enmeshed with their mothers as well as enmeshment issues in general. So that's kind of where this webinar comes from. A lot of my focus with my clients is brings them back to their relationships um, and how they can have more satisfying, fulfilling relationships. Because I think that's the whole point of recovery. Um, just getting sober is, uh, I think, way too hard to have sobriety be the end goal um, and not have that blossom into something wonderful like relationships that you're excited to be a part of and feel engaged in. So um, I went a little crazy this weekend, Tammy, and I've mapped out the next year of these episodes. Wow. Um, so I feel like we've got some really good topics. Um, these are going to pull a lot from the assessments that I use with couples um, when I work with them. I, I think of these assessments as my x-rays into how um, their relationships are working. So um, the next year, and of course, there's going to be room for questions and other, um, other topics people might want to cover, but I want to go through piece by piece what makes a relationship work according to those valid and reliable assessments. And talk about each component. So today we're gonna to talk about global satisfaction levels in relationships, or think about this as being able to um, see the forest through the trees. Um, I think one of the most confusing things about a relationship is uh, if, if, you, if you take your temperature at any given point in time about how you feel about your primary relationship or about an important relationship, it may be just that, a snapshot in time. Are you happy in this relationship? Well, I'm happy right now, but if you would have asked me an hour ago, I would have said no. <laughs> Our feelings can be really uh, mercurial. They can change um, at a moment's notice. And that can make it confusing to make decisions about whether or not to continue to invest in our relationships, making decisions about whether or not it's time for a big change or whether we need to stay the course um, because it can change. So hopefully today, as we talk about our global satisfaction level, I can give some insights and some tools for being able to gauge overall how is the relationship going and what leads to our overall satisfaction level with relationships. And this, of course, can apply outside of romantic relationships. I think um, there's, there's good application here for a relationship with children, um, your job, coworkers, boss, friends, um, things like that. So I'll start out as I have been trying to do more often with a, how, how you learn about this in your individual recovery. Um, so most of the time when I start meeting with someone who's struggling with uh, sexual addiction or a partner who has just discovered um, betrayal, many of them will go to a support group like a 12-step group or a smart recovery meeting or, or some other kind of group um, to get help. And most often what I hear when I ask, how did it go? They'll say, it went great. This is going to be so good for me. You know, there's, there's people who know my story. Um, I can get a lot of help here. Um, and what I notice, depending on the health of the group that they're a part of, what I notice is over time, the people who are part of a healthier group, the, the ability for that group to respond to their needs will evolve over time with them. Um, folks who are part of a group that's maybe a little more rigid or a little more crisis focused, eventually they'll get to a point where they're saying things like, I don't know, it just seems like they're not quite understanding me. Or I hear this a lot from folks that I work with. I don't know, my sponsor really wants to focus on my sobriety plan and I've been sober with no issues for nine months. I feel like I need to move on to something else. And he's telling me sobriety is, is the most important thing. So there's a big mismatch there. Um, so in those dynamics, when, when I have a client coming in saying, I don't know if this group is going to work for me. One way of looking at that is they're not satisfied with their relationships there anymore. It's not working anymore. And so we have to look at some specific things like, are your needs the same? as when you got into this group. Um, are you able to communicate your needs clearly? Uh, are you able to communicate your needs in a way that people understand and they can adjust if they're willing to adjust? Um, have you for now finished your work on those issues and you need to move on to something else? Like a lot of my clients will focus uh, really intensely on getting sober and six months to a year down the road, um, getting sober is not their big struggle, but they're having a hard time understanding their emotions or a lot of family of origin stuff is coming up 
or they really want to improve their relationships and to continue to go back to a group that focuses on getting people sober is just missing the mark for them. So it's that level of satisfaction that really tunes them into whether or not a change needs to be made. Um, so when we look at whether we're unhappy versus we're unhappy in a relationship, I think the biggest indicator of our level of happiness, our confidence in our partner, the level of closeness we feel, the level of connection that we feel, um, it has to do with whether the dynamics of this, the, the unhelpful dynamics of this relationship, whether they're road bumps that we can talk about and we can work through, or whether these are longstanding issues that I don't get the feeling are ever going to be resolved. You know, when we, when we go to a partner, we go to a, a child, a parent, a coworker, and we say, hey, this is going on between the two of us and this is really difficult, and we feel them respond and they say something like, oh my gosh, I wasn't aware, or yeah, I've been feeling that too, let's really dive into this, and we see changes happen, we tend to be satisfied in those relationships because we feel a, a level of connection, we feel a level of being seen, we have confidence that our needs are, are important to this other and that they're going to be responded to. And that in turn is most likely going to increase our level of satisfaction in the relationship. When we're in those relationships where we say, it's always been this way, my partner thinks X, Y, Z, and nothing on earth could convince them otherwise, not even me saying, hey, this really hurts that you see the world this way and that you act accordingly. When those kind of dynamics are really entrenched, our satisfaction in the relationship tends to go down because we don't have a lot of confidence in our partner's desire or ability to show up for us and help us. We don't have a lot of, um, there's not a lot of closeness because or connection because there's a lot of inflexibility. And I think all of that exhaustion from trying to manage the dynamic leaves very little energy left for us to invest in activities, behaviors, experiences that bring us closer together and increase our level of happiness. So it's really, being able to accurately gauge our level of satisfaction in our relationship comes from taking the whole relationship story and I think looking at those factors. Do I have confidence in my partner? Does my partner have confidence in me? Do I feel close with my partner? Can my partner get close to me? Um, am I overall happy in this relationship? Is my partner overall happy in this relationship? And is there connection that both of us have access to? Those components, I think more than anything, really contribute to our level of satisfaction. So there's a couple of places, I would say there's three places that we can look um, at potentially making changes that would increase our level of satisfaction or give us a chance to be more satisfied with our relationships. So the first one is looking at our behavioral contributions. Um, Tammy knows this and those of you who have been here before know this. I think every one of these I talk about my children. So. I said to my wife yesterday, I said, I'd really like to get to a place again where my kids, where our kids are not just bugging the crap out of me every moment. And she laughed and she said, you've been saying that since they were born. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's true. I said, I feel like I made some progress and I, I held better space for several months. And now I'm just kind of back to this, like it's really hard to spend time with them. Um, I've also been a lot more engrossed in getting stuff done around our house, wrapping up projects, doing improvements. So as I look at my own behavior, I'm not available for the kind of connection they like to be a part of. Um, I'm available to ask them if they want to help me, which, you know, right now they're in a stage where when I say the word help, I might as well like say the nastiest insult to them. Um, you know, so as I look at my behavioral contributions, I don't have a lot of time to spend time with them on their terms. And that I think they protest, they, they throw fits, they, you know, get annoying to get my attention. Um, and that's in large part on me. So the first place that we look to increase our satisfaction is, kid, is there something I could change about my behavior that would make it easier for this other person to be in a relationship with me? The other part of that equation, I think, is to look at your partner's behavioral contributions to the relationship and ask yourself, when I have a concern or when I, when I ask them about a certain behavior or help them, I, I think about it as helping our partner check out blind spots, when I bring that up, do they respond and do they make adjustments accordingly? Do I feel them accepting my influence? Not doing what I say and making all the changes I want them to make, but do I feel them pause and redirect a bit because they're hearing me and because they value me? Um, the third thing to ask is, is this thing that's getting under my skin, is this a make or break issue um, or can there be repair? And if there can be repair, is it going to be a short term process or will this be a longer term process for us to to get at this 
So really asking ourselves, um, is this something that I am willing to have a relationship changing interaction over, whether that's a fight that ends things or whether that's a, an insistence that we make some changes to how we interact with each other in our relationship? Um, or is this one of those things from my end too that I could work on changing some of my expectations and some of my approach in the relationship so that I can get a more helpful response from my partner? Um, all of those things, I, I think it's, it's human nature. The things that we feel best about are the things that we feel open and flexible in. And I believe our relationships are, are the same way. If there's not an ability for there to be openness and flexibility, it's going to be very hard to be open, happy, connected, and close in a relationship. Um, when we bid for changes, when we bid for flexibility and our partner responds, I think that increases our level of, of um, competence. It certainly increases the level of flexibility in the relationship. And there's a lot of room to grow, which I think is the main reason why human beings keep relationships and why we work so hard at them is because there's experiences that we have together with someone in a relationship that we don't have on our own. They're, they're just not accessible. So any questions? We can take questions on that topic or any comments from you, Tammy? Well, I do, you know, I really like, well, I always like your topics, even when they're kind of difficult and challenging, but I, you know, I was thinking about this too, when you're, you started out with look at my own behavior first. And I think that that's really important for, for us to do, I had to laugh because you know, with your kids, I was like, well, first of all, you say help. You should say, I've got a new game for you. And here's <laughs> what it is. you've got the wrong, you know, it's called reframing, reframe it's it. It's the wrong approach. It's a game. It's a game. Um, you know, and the other thing I'm going to, as a uh, person with adult children now and grandchildren is this will fly by. You will, yeah. be, what happened? And it's in a blink of an eye. So the moments are, are long, but it goes quickly. So, so just, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember that, but um, yeah. at some moments be grateful they're bugging yet because they're around and you get to interact with them and they care about you. But I was also thinking too, that your level of, um, uh, I mean, you know, you've got a lot on your plate, so therefore they're feeling, you know, there's less to connect to. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure they're going, I'm going to be more annoying because I'm going to get your attention, whether it's good or bad. So yeah. So I think that's really helpful. And, you know, and, and even in that situation, it's like, okay, I'm going to, you know, doing whatever task this is, is not as important as, you know, growing these children. So maybe it's just going, well, I'm going to take this hour and I'm going to be fully present. So, but, you know, and, and then the partner's level of being able to show up, um, you know, I think that that's really huge. And, you know, I know, cause I know some of uh, the people here and, you know, there are people that are not willing to show up. So they're constantly mm -hmm. in the struggle of, you know, I show up, I'm doing what I can and I'm evaluating my stuff but then the other person is unwilling unable whatever you know to to show up so so for some of these it's like you know and and it may be that it can't be a make or break because the circumstances are such that you can't so so you know the, you know that that makes it it very difficult so with some of these maybe it's just incremental you go well in this moment this is all i can do so so you know i can go well i can do a few things that, that are are willing you know that might make the the scenery a little different but you mm -hmm. know but you without being able to even vision that there could be a long-term you know change for that so it's it's challenging you know I love that we talk about these things and I think that they're hugely you know beneficial particularly for people that are you know in that place of wanting to change even when you talked about you know initially I went through several different you know home groups because as as I changed, I needed something different. And, yeah. and I think meetings have personalities and even the personality of the groups changes people, you know, flux in and out of them as well. So, you know, I think it's being able to identify what you need. Um, and, and it isn't even throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's still good for me to go to first step meetings, you know, and be reminded because yeah. I don't want to forget and go, Oh, I'm so lofty and I'm up here. No, I still am an addict one drink away from, you know, a, a, everything bad you know so so i have to keep that in mind but i also do need to work on those things that are you know are problematic in relationships or problematic in me too so mm -hmm. um and, and the other thing too i was thinking because i had a 
you know, a situation recently where there was, and I knew it was like, you know, and the other person had stuff going on and I had stuff going on and we were just, you know, not, not quite, you know, but, but the being willing and just going, you know, and it's okay. And, you know, it's still not perfect, but it's, it's, it's okay because we both value the relationship and we both have stuff going on. So, when you know, we'll, we'll just continue to you know support each other how we can and show up as we can not as full as we'd like to for each other right now but that's okay so um but good relationship stuff so um uh so um okay so there's a couple of questions so i'll start with these one is how do i emotionally deal with the number of partners my husband had during his addiction i'm feeling physically ill about that yeah um you know, there's there's pieces of information that I think are necessary um, to be known to make an informed decision about whether or not you want to continue in the relationship. And this is one of those things that I think is an absolutely must know um, to know how many if your if your partner has acted out sexually with others, how many, how frequently, um, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I would say in the long run, the way that we start to deal with that is whenever there's any kind of disclosure of betrayal, no matter the magnitude, we have to now figure out where this piece of information sits with this person that we thought we knew in one way. Um, and I'll often talk with the, the men and, and the, the women that I work with who are on the addiction side of the, the table and I'll ask them questions like, what kind of man has X number of extramarital apart partners when he's still telling his partner that he's committed? And I don't ask that in a way to invoke shame, but more like I really want them to think about what part of me was active there and why could I have such a big split? Um, and that's really something that I think for the addict comes later on in recovery, being able to grapple with that. You know, early on I'll get answers with, well, you know, it's, that's the nature of addiction. It just makes you crazy. Or, um, you know, I was just really sorely tempted and that's what happens. And all of that can be going on, but it's not the full picture. And it doesn't create the sense of this person who I know in this way is also capable of this. And how do I reconcile those two? So part of that's going to come with time as you get to know your partner, um, as you get to know your partner better through recovery and you get to know more parts of them. Um, you may be able to place, oh, that's, that's that darkness in them. I see where that is. And hopefully what they give you is a, a picture of them knowing that too, and them being able to grapple with that darkness rather than ignore it and have it pop up in unexpected ways. Um, I think in the short term too, um, so, so that's a longer term strategy. I think in the short term, one of the things to do with that is recognize that that information is traumatic. It's a blow to your nervous system. You know, so to get into a lot of like mental, he must be thinking this, he must be feeling that, this is who this person is, recognize that what you're experiencing is acute abandonment um, and acute trauma. So a lot of how you deal with it short term is we learn how to breathe again. We learn how to mindfully shift our focus to something that is less disturbing, less dysregulating, not because we want to pretend like that other thing doesn't exist, but because we need a break from it. We learn how to shelf things intentionally. Um, I think reaching out to other people who have been through the same thing, um, who have also found out that their, their uh, partner had multiple people that they acted out with, um, talking to others and seeing what's going on inside of us reflected on their face because they understand us and they empathize with us. That kind of human to human connection and that co-regulation. I talked about that several months back, um, emotionally co-regulating that's some of the most effective nervous system regulating we do now. And right now in the short term, that is the task is to get your nervous system back on board to get it regulating again. And that's primarily a physiological thing, um, learning and utilizing what soothes us and calms us on a regular basis, being able to use boundaries and space in order to mitigate our level of anxiety you know, so um, having the option in, in cases like this, I think sometimes it can be helpful to have the option to say, I don't want you sleeping next to me tonight. I'm feeling really triggered. I need you to go somewhere else. I need my own space. And to have your partner be able to respond in a way where they say, I get it. I know what you're going through. Um, I don't know how many um, times I've recommended this book, but this is exactly what this book is about for the men who have done the betraying is 
getting that background and understanding the, the state of trauma that their partner is in so that when their partner says things like, I'm sick looking at you today, they don't take that in this horribly defensive way, but they're able to say, I understand. Um, how can I show up for you? Well, I think too, when, um, you know, cause it, it's challenging, it, it's easy for the addict to go, well, that's just part of addiction or whatever, because then I'm pushing it off and I'm not having to go, oh my gosh, I'm so ashamed or I'm so whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it keeps it out there. Um, uh, but yeah, whether it's the number or it's the relationship, you know, it's, you know, um, they, uh, the affair partner was my best friend, my sister, whatever. I mean, all of those things are so traumatic and, um, and, you know, my heart goes out to you cause I, you know, I know how hard this is. I, I hope you are connecting with the drop-in groups. There was a betrayed partner mm -hmm. group on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And then there's another one at 12.30 p.m. Wednesday um, Pacific time. And um, that's a safe space. So like the emotional regulation that John was talking about, you know, you can see each other like John and I can see each other, you know, and you can share where you're at and, and you can have other people support you and you can support them, you know, in some ways as well. So I would invite you to, um, to join those safe spaces for, for connecting, um, you know, on this site as well, so. Mm -hmm. So next question, how can I tell the difference between changing my expectations versus letting my addicted spouse walk all over my boundaries? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, it's such a fine line, isn't it? Um, I think your body's going to tell you the truth about that. Um, when I come across uh, the need to change my expectations, I often feel something that I'm holding very tightly to, and it exhausts me to hold tightly to it because what I'm holding tightly to is not serving me. So for example, um, there was a woman I worked with a couple years back who she came to session one day and she floored me because she'd been talking for weeks and weeks about how her addicted boyfriend, who was also, he was in very early recovery and um, she could see him making efforts, but he couldn't hold a lot for her emotionally. So she came to session one day and she was looking very relieved. And I said, what's going on? And she said, I think I realized one of the things that's causing me suffering. And I told my boyfriend, um, I'm not going to expect a lot of emotional support from you right now, because I know you're going through a lot for yourself. And I know that this isn't a skill set that you really have right now. So um, I'm going to get my emotional needs met in other ways for now. And I'm going to quit bringing that back to you with this expectation that you'll be able to empathize with me and you'll be able to understand me and that you'll treat me softly because I know that that's not where you're at right now. And she was able to put it in a way to him that he got it. And he said, thank you. Like that, that's going to, that's going to feel really good to me. Um, and I, one of the things I expressed to her is I said, I, I have a concern that you're still going to have needs that you're going to want him to meet. And that's going to be really disappointing for you. And she said, I know that I can give him this space for at least three months. And I've let him know for 90 days, I'm not going to, circle back and try to lean on him too much emotionally. And she did it. Wow. And she said at, at the end of those 90 days, she reassessed and she went back to him and she said, ready or not, here I come. <laughs> so I, I need this from you now. Um, and so for her, the changing the expectation came from I'm suffering because I want you to X, Y, Z. And I can see that you can't. I can see that that's not possible. But also part of that changing that expectation is she didn't change what she was going to be expecting out of that relationship long-term. She made a short-term change. And then she circled back to reassess her need. Um, so that's a really important part of, of changing expectations. Is there an opportunity for you to circle back? Um, does your partner, like in this case, does your partner understand the change in expectation that you're making? And can you put that out there in a way that says, I know, long term or I know in the future you can do better but right now I see that's not where you're at would you be willing to work toward this for me that's one of the things that my my client um, said and and her boyfriend worked with his therapist on that and he actually did get better at empathizing he got better at holding some space for her um, but she had kind of laid that out and given given the timeline the letting go of my addicted spouse and, and let uh, having them walk over my boundaries that's much more of a defeated feeling um, I think when we change our expectations, there's some resolve. I think when we just let go and let people walk all over our boundaries, we feel defeated and we may feel like it doesn't matter anyway. So that internal sense is really going to tell you what's the difference. 
Um, I think also in the letting my addicted spouse walk over my boundaries, when we choose to change our expectations, we don't develop as much resentment. When we allow people to walk all over us, um, we experience a lot of resentment. Um, so even just imagining if I was to have this conversation, would I feel relief or would I feel resentment? And that's probably a really good indicator of whether or not you're changing expectations to something that's more realistic and useful or whether you're um, letting someone off the hook for something that they, they need to be responsible for, um, they need to be on the hook for. So that's, that's where I would start with that one. Check for the relief or the resentment in the change that you want to make. I think that's really helped to, I was thinking I would be resentful. I would, you know, I would immediately be resentful if I was, you know, getting, you know, walked all over. So yeah. I like that perspective. And I really appreciate that in the example you used, the boyfriend was willing to, you know, like, okay, I've got 90 days. I'm going to work on this so that I can, you know, make progress with, and I'm confident that it wasn't a hundred percent, you know, on day 91 that everything was good, but, you know, hopefully there was, you know, he's made progress and she's, yeah change things so that it was, you know, there was some um, mutual, mu mutually beneficial territory in there. So, yeah. um, so uh, there is a follow-up to that. I often question, um, am I expecting too much of the other person gaslighting me and not willing to be responsible for their own stuff? Yeah. Again, I think your body tells you the story. Um, you know, I, I've worked with uh, clients before who have told me they desperately want connection in their relationship. And then week after week, they come back and talk about how they really, how there was a big explosion and things are really messed up. Um, and, and again, I, I think it's possible to tell the difference between someone who earnestly wants it and doesn't know how, you know, you'll feel sincerity from them. Um, you will, again, you'll feel that sense in them. Like you might feel some compassion or some um, empathy um, when someone's using you and they're manipulating, um, again, you're going to feel resentment. You're going to feel anger. Um, you're going to feel that sense of they, they are offloading onto me um, what should be their responsibility rather than I'm willing to hold this space so that this responsibility gets done in our relationship. When we're playing a, hot, a game of hot potato with responsibilities in a relationship, I think that's a good sign that um, manipulation is going on. When it feels like that collaborative, like, you know, I, I think it's important for couples or anybody who's in any kind of relationship with each other to check in with each other. And if one of us is busy or one of us is stressed for a period of time, we may get together and say, hey, you know, the, the ability for us to check in or to have dedicated time together to connect, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to do that in the way I have before. Like, could you, could you be the one that leads that up for now? Um, that's going to feel collaborative rather than I always find myself picking up this ball that my partner is always dropping and we, we don't talk about it. Um, so that's, that's what I would go a little further in saying, um, being able to tell the difference of, is it a problem with your expectations? Or are you being gaslighted? Someone who's not being willing to be responsible. Just ask yourself, how slimy does this feel? <laughs> I find that's a good emotional uh, gauging question. Um, we can be asked to do things that we don't like, and it could it could not feel slimy. It could just feel inconvenient. Um, but that slimy, if you feel used in any way, um, there's probably someone who's shirking responsibility there. Okay, next question. What are your thoughts on surveillance of the partner who cheated? My partner is agreeing to do whatever it takes to build trust again. I'm not sure that it will help. I figure if he really wants to cheat, he will find a way. Say the last part of that question, you're right. You know, if your partner is not sincere about um, stopping their behavior, they will find a way to do it, even around any kind of surveillance or monitoring um, you can do. That, however, does not mean that there's no place for any kind of surveillance or monitoring. Um, the times where I've seen it be effective, it's a mutual thing. Um, the person who is being surveilled or monitored understands that that's an opportunity for them to provide accountability and provide transparency. Um, the person who's doing the monitoring sees that as an access hatch. You know, when we find out that, um, when we find out a partner's been keeping secrets from us, what we experience is this, I've been on the outside of something I thought I was smack dab in the middle of. And so what accountability or surveillance can do is it can create this, if I need to, if I need to verify what's going on inside the relationship, like, 
you'll give me your phone, you'll let me look at emails, you'll let me look at texts, you'll let me verify that you're not keeping secrets. And again, it's that mutually agreed upon thing. Um, I, I think if surveillance or monitoring um, comes from a place of, I'm just gonna catch that blankety blank in the act again. Um, w when we go in with suspicion, most likely our suspicions are going to be confirmed. Um, when we go in with an open mind or, or openness to, um, I know it's possible that this could be happening. I'm really hoping the story is, is changing. Um, then we can actually incorporate data with the story changing. Um, so in, in this question, I would say when it comes to monitoring, when it comes to surveillance, it's really up to you as the partner to decide what kind of information or access would be helpful to you. Um, some, some spouses and partners that I work with, um, they really like being the one who has the password for their partner's accountability or blocking software. Um, and that gives them a sense of um, control. That gives them a sense of um, I'll know what's going on. And there's others who say, I want to be the last person to know about this, but I want you to do it with somebody. Um, I want you to do this with a sponsor. I want you to do, with, do this with a therapist or a, a support person. Um, so while your partner may be um, agreeing to whatever it takes, know that when it comes to rebuilding your trust and um, mending the wounds in your heart, um, you're the one who gets to determine what that's going to take. You know, so if you don't want surveillance and you don't want all that data, don't go there. You don't have to. Um, that accountability can be provided in other ways. So you held up out of the doghouse a few minutes ago, and that book, it, Dr. Rob wrote specifically for men who cheat and how to rebuild trust. So, you know, I highly recommend uh, that you you both read that one. The other thing is there's an Out of the Dog House podcast on the Sex, Love, and Addiction podcast series. So would invite you to listen to that as well. But the, you know, as Dr. Rob says, he gets about 12 cents for the book. So it's not like, <laughs> it's about the content that's in, in, uh, in between the covers on that one. It's really important information on, you know, on rebuilding, you know, trust. And, um, uh, I agree. If they really want to cheat, they will find a way. I was talking to a partner um, the last few days and, and his computer was password protected. Uh, so he, um, he gets on hers and uses a password and he uh, he got on porn sites that he wasn't supposed to be on. So, so it's like where, you know, where it's like your kids. If you think that, well, I've, you know, taken care of my kids, you no, know, they'll go to their friend's house. You have to, you yeah. have to plan ahead. So, um, and addicts are wily and they will. So, um, you know, that's part of the whole gaslighting thing is, you know, yes, I've, you, you've got all my stuff, but they still, you know, figure that out. So what, if they really want to rebuild trust, they're going to do the things that will help you um, uh, have safety. So, and you don't indicate if he's an addict or not, or, and I'm not going to say if he just cheated, cause that's still really painful, but, but it's like, if, if there's addiction involved, you know, then it's treating the, the addiction. If it's, he, he it was unfaithful, you know, then it's rebuilding trust, you know, from that standpoint. Um, but so, so I don't know, but you know, there is, there is help and hope. And, um, that book does a darn good job of laying out some very practical things, you know, to help you both move forward in a, in a different way. So next question, I'm worried that my boyfriend is not living his sobriety and just doing his sobriety. Oh, that's good. Um, I would say on the outside, he's using words that allow me to believe he's feeling feelings. Um, uh, he's, sorry. Um, I would say on the outside, he's using words that allow me to believe he's feeling feelings and holding space for me, but he's fooled me before. And he's also um, a doer and attacks projects with the intent to get an A plus. How do I know? I can't even trust myself to know anymore. Another really, really great question. Um, and this is a common one that I hear um, from partners when they've discovered that there's betrayal is um, he's done this before. Um, I think of a couple that I worked with a while ago, I was helping them through a disclosure process and I presented them some different options for doing disclosure. And, and one of the things that I said is generally I, I use letter writing in this disclosure process. And immediately both of them said, that's not going to work. Um, he who was the addict, uh, he was an attorney and he said, I am really good at writing and I have used writing and notes and letters before to um, cover up and to gaslight. And I said, and he said, so I don't think she's going to trust me on that. And she said, exactly. 
I can't trust what he writes. So what she wanted was she would ask the questions live and he would respond to them live. And we did as many sessions as we needed to of that. And um, there was a piece there, I think in his recognition of what he had done before and him calling the time out on that suggestion before she did, that was part of the rebuilding the trust. She started getting a, a sense that he was looking out for her safety um, and not just taking a path forward that would be convenient for him. Um, the same couple, I would say one of the biggest uh, changes that happened in their whole relationship dynamic was he was, he was technically sober, but very relationally distant. Um, he had started a new business a couple years into sobriety and it was very stressful for him. And she of course was very concerned that with this level of stress, he was going to be relapsing again. And she would, she would want to know what was going on in his day for a couple of reasons. First of all, she was worried about how he was handling the stress, but I would say more importantly, she just wanted to be connected to her partner. You know, she would say, you go off and you spend 10, 12 hours a day working on this. And I don't know anything about what's going on um, in your day. And I, I want to know. And um, they fought over this for probably a couple months, whether or not he was going to check in at the end of the day or whether he was going to answer the question, how was work today? Um, and um, I had them do this exercise where they, they listed out. Um, I talked about this, I think, when Scott was on the webinar um, negotiation. I had them list out their negotiations. That was last week, the donuts. I, it was, was me. It just last week? Yep. That's right. I may have told this story last week then. Um, the thing they listed in their, their non-negotiables, um, they were mutually exclusive and he had to go and think, is this what I want my relationship to end over? And, um, he said no. And that was a moment from, from there forward, he really dug deep and he gave her more of what she needed emotionally, not because that was important to him, but because he realized it was important for her and he made changes in the fundamental way he approached the relationship because he wanted his partner to know that he was there for, he wanted to help her with her anxiety. So some of this, like, you know, attacking projects and, and getting an A plus, I work with a lot of guys who that's their approach to everything in life. And of course they're going to approach recovery like that in the beginning. And there will be some usefulness to that. Um, they'll get accountable really quick. You know, they'll get into meetings, they'll, they'll do all the right things. Um, I think it can take some time for them to recognize that it's not just about doing, it's about the feeling and what it's like to, to be with them um, as they're doing that. So I think that's part of what you want to do is kind of put yourself in this perch where maybe you can appreciate the progress and things that he's working on, but also not attach your confidence to that if that's something that you don't have a lot of confidence in. Um, you know, not because you don't want to believe him, but because he's demonstrated that he can do that dog and pony show before. There's other people who, um, you know, other partners uh, that I've worked with who their, their spouse doing anything proactive and for their self-improvement is so foreign that them just diving into recovery and doing that kind of stuff is what restores trust, you know? So it's, I, I, I read in this that you're tuning into your gut and saying, yeah, this is all good, but I know this part of my partner. Um, and, that's, that's good that you're tuning into that. I, I think that's, that's necessary. So pull yourself back in a, in a safe perch, observe and appreciate the, the benefits of behavior change, but also hold some space open that you're going to need something different from him emotionally. And that maybe right now he may not be able to, that may not click for him. If it can't be put on a to-do list, it may not click for him. Um, so if this is a relationship that uh, you want to, you want to keep and you want to see how it goes. One of the things that you could do is allow some time for him to settle into some recovery routines to where his mind might open to that. Okay. What else, what am I missing? Um, piece and then give him some of that feedback. Um, you know, you're a really great doer. You're really good at accomplishing things, but I don't feel really emotionally connected to you because I wonder how much your feelings are connected into the things that you do. And then you let him go chew on that with his therapist and his sponsor. And if you're in relationship counseling, you talk about it there. Um, when you have this last line in here, I can't even trust myself to know anymore. Um, that to me feels like a statement of truth. Um, and that may be something important for you to, to hold on to is you don't have to be the one who makes the evaluation of whether this is enough or not. You don't have to decide right now either. 
um, you know, let your nervous system and your intuition come back on board um, before you start making these decisions about your relationship and, and whether or not you can trust again. It's okay for trust to be suspended for a very long time after betrayal. That's the nature of betrayal. I often say to the addicts that I work with, unfortunately, you don't get to pick the set of consequences or how long they're going to last after this. Um, your partner gets to decide what kind of time and space they need to heal. Um, and if I'll say this to the, the addicts I work with, if you want to keep this relationship, um, you're going to follow your partner's cues on what they need rather than demanding that trust happens right now or that you're doing so well that they can be okay now. Um, let them be in charge of their own story. Well, and a relapse resets the clock. So, yep. you know, if, if there isn't you know, moving forward in recovery, you know, now it's back to, you know, I can't trust, I can't trust this person because they did it again. So, so, yeah. yeah. So the, the person that asked about the surveillance says he just started recovery a year ago. I found out about sexting apps using sex worker twice and opiate abuse. He started recovery, then he stopped opiates, but had three relapses in regards to sexting. We just determined that he likely has sexual compulsions, usually by watching hours of porn. Yeah, this, this just determined part is really standing out to me. When the information is new, often neither you or your addicted partner know exactly the nature of the problem or what needs to be done. Um, so while I can appreciate where that comes from, I'll do whatever it takes. Um, oftentimes the men that I'm working with who say that, they say that early on. Um, and then when they really understand whatever it takes, they may have different feelings about that. You know, so, so I would take that as a token of um, he's recognizing that there's a big problem here and that's good. Um, but really, it sounds like some more information is going to be coming out or needs to come out some more conceptualization of what the problem is before you know exactly what you're going to need and what his course of healing is going to look like. So hopefully you're connected with um, some good therapists and some good support people that can help to kind of fill that out a little bit when it comes to um, drugs and sex, um, it's a complicated issue. Um, and, and the path to healing can be complicated too. So, you know, just because all options are on the table or I have a lot of options in front of me doesn't mean that I have to use all of them or want to use all of them. Um, I, I love the saying from Alcoholics Anonymous that says more will be revealed. Um, and it will more about his behavior and what that may be, or more about how you feel about it and what you need. And, um, changing your mind down the road because you know more about yourself, you know more about the situation, that's totally, um, that's totally in bounds. That's, that's totally necessary. And I would invite you or beg you to not get uh, the disclosure where he just starts telling you things, um, you yeah. know, cause it sounds like it's been little pieces of things. So more will be revealed, but um, hopefully you're working with qualified therapists. I say this, you know, with, with uh, Dr. Rob all the time to qualified therapists. There's a whole bunch of people out there, well-meaning therapists, um, uh, but they just don't have the training for this uh, field, you know, area of the field. And so, um, and often, you know, I hear about it after, all, you know, they've been through and, you know, the relationship is, you know, further disintegrated and the partner's further traumatized and all of that. So, so ideally having someone who can help, you know, intervene on that early on and, you know, and hold the space, you know, so that, you know, he's working, he, you know, he gets stabilized. It is tough when there's co-occurring, um, you mm -hmm. know, Dr. Rob and Dr. David Fawcett collaborated on the Seeking Integrity Los Angeles program specifically around that because most programs either, uh, most programs treat chemical dependency and don't you know, address the sexual addiction intimacy disorder or the handful of places that do address sex addiction and um, don't really deal with the co-occurring chemical dependency. Mm -hmm. You know, you may go off to the chemical dependency area for a few days or whatever, but they aren't looking at it, you know, um, as, as uh, the, the co-occurring paired, you know, addiction. Um, and uh, for, you know, so for, for people, it's, it's challenging. It's a brilliant program. If I had a loved one that was male, you know, it'd be where I want them to go. Am I affiliated with it? Yes. But here's the deal. It's really challenging. You know, when you start not using the addictive behavior and you're also trying to, uh, you've got feelings and all of these other things. So, so all the things that the addiction 
covered or helped you manage through the numbing, the escape, all of that. So the things that you could push off, all of a sudden you're dealing with those and it's frightening, it's terrifying, it's, it's horrible. And early on, you don't have enough tools to really deal with that effectively. So I'm not surprised that he's relapsed, you know, with, with sexting and, you know, whatever else, it, because it's very difficult to get that foundation. So the, the, the good thing about a program is it gives you that solid foundation, helps you work through some initial shame and it kind of gets you, okay, here's the plan, you know, that, you know, that you can implement, you know, as you're leaving, you know, um, and that the spouse has awareness of too, so that it's not, you know, I have said before, so an addict returns from treatment saying, well, they told me ABC and the partner can go, no, they told you X, Y, Z. Not that you have to um, police them, but just that you're on the same page, that you have the same mm -hmm. information. It levels the playing field and gives you that foundation. So, um, so if you need, um, and this is always an invite, if you need information for qualified resources, you know, go to uh, seekingintegrity.com or sexandrelationshiphealing.com and you can do the contact us and um, you know just tell us what you're looking for and we'll do our best to help you find you know qualified resources um, and for both of you so there's men's um, uh, support you know there was one this morning at 10:45 a.m. Pacific time just before this one that's a men's drop-in group and there will be another one Sunday night um, and then there's the partner drop-in group so there's free support spaces for you know each of you and then the webinars of course as well with dr rob dr david john you know, kristen snowden um you know so there's a number of different opportunities you know to help it won't fix everything but sure you know can provide some support and help so um there was a comment in here um uh, the, the, with my family, it's getting easier with boundaries are consistent. However, it's very difficult to deal with uh, her son's father as he gaslights and manipulates so much you know, for my own sanity. I can only deal with him in email. That's a good boundary. And I'm not mm -hmm. consistent with this as it started to open space for the grief to come up on the loss of what there was and should have been and what there is not enough of. You know, that, that right there is the statement of why we do therapy, right? There's something I know is good for me, but it's hard for me to do consistently because as I get what I need, feelings and grief come up. That's why behavior change is so hard. Um, you know, and I, I read that and I, I hear the positive in there. I've identified where my boundary is. I've identified how I, how I deal the best. Um, but sometimes, sometimes coping in our best way does not mean we're going to feel our best. Sometimes coping in our best way um, brings up an invitation for grief, brings up an invitation for sadness. Um, and I hope that becomes part of the boundary plan too for you is that you, um, you start to get some help and support with how you can grieve well, um, how you can hold some of those emotions so that um, the emotions can be flexible instead of the boundaries being flexible. Um, you know, I, I just in situations like this, you know, recognizing that um, the grief isn't going to last forever, that you're not going to feel this acute loss forever. And, you know, that that's one of the reasons why we, like in this case, you might take the interaction out of email is because you're feeling the absence of that person. And, you know, we used to be able to talk on the phone, or we used to be able to talk face to face, and there's elements of that I miss. Um, you know, being able to, to recognize that that acute missing that person where the relationship has changed, that won't last forever, that can help you hold the boundary. Um, you, you can you can tolerate that discomfort, you can tolerate that sadness. Um, and, and for me, that's usually a really helpful redirect. I can tolerate whatever this is that's uncomfortable for me, and it's easier for me to tolerate this than it is for me to tolerate untold amounts of time of more of this unhelpful, dysfunctional pattern. Um, so I wish you luck in that. Glad you've identified the boundary, and I hope you keep practicing it. Yeah, well, and I was thinking, too, it's easy to you know, uh, to fantasize about, well, you know, or romanticize actually is the better term probably. I romanticize, you know, what it could have been, it should have been, and it should be like, you know, a movie or whatever. And it's like, that's not what reality is. But you know, to be able to, um, I liked what you said about flexible on the emotions rather than flexible on the boundaries. That's, you know, that's an important concept, I think, as well to um, you know, to consider, it's like, these are my boundaries. I, you know, I love that she hadn't said, you know, 
I'm only dealing with him via email because otherwise, you know, apparently it goes sideways. Well, good. And this is how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to pick my, you know, for me, it'd be like, and it isn't going to be the thing pings in and, you know, I'm, I'm Pavlov's dog, you know, running and responding. It'd be like, no, I'll, you know, I'll respond to that one when I'm in the right headspace to do it too. So yep. good stuff. So any other questions or comments? Got a few minutes left. I'll share about the podcast series. It's, um, the sex love and addiction and and john has has done um a couple of podcasts with dr rob on that series um so if you haven't listened to it yet i'd invite you to do so but the sex love and addiction podcast series is doing phenomenally well i think it's in one of the top 50 podcasts wow i'm not 100 percent sure because of it but but it, you know it's it's done amazingly well for a little podcast that we just started doing but you know he's had some great guests and there's, you know, we, we quote different uh, topics from uh, different podcasts. There, there's something on lots of different things and he's got more uh, that are being recorded. So there'll be more. And David Fawcett now has a series, you know, for gay, bisexual and transgender men. Um, and his are really interesting too. So it's not just about addiction. You know, he, he's had some, uh, I've listened to, I've only had the opportunity to listen to a couple of them so far, but, but, you know, very interesting, even on the history of things, um, uh, you know, in the, in the gay world, et cetera. So it was, it's been fascinating. So those are free resources on there. You know, the webinars, the drop-in groups we've already mentioned are, um, so, you know, please, you know, connect with that. Um, so someone said, thank you, uh, or this is affirming and it has me looking at my part in the relationship. That's great. So that's, and then. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I'd also, I'd also put out there, um, even in instances where there's been betrayal, um, I think it is important to look at our part in the relationship, not because we caused that betrayal or that we could prevent it, but because going forward, we want a different relationship and it takes two people being mindful about the relationship to do that. So you know, even though there's been betrayal, um, I think it can be really useful to look at your part because if you're sticking with this relationship now, I'm guessing there's some hope that you could rebuild something that you want to be a part of in the future. And um, that will, that you'll, you'll want to be different in that. Um, I, I don't think there's anybody who looks at their relationship and says, I would do it exactly as I've been doing it. There's always something you know, different. So there's, I, I love that room for personal growth. Well, and you know, we talk about grieving the loss of the relationship you thought you had. So if there's hope for the future, it's hope for a different relationship. So it has to be built on, on both of you coming to it from a different perspective. Uh, so this says, because of years of neglect, feeling alone, feeling emotionally distant, manipulated, gaslighted, and overall crazy making because he would choose porn over me, I felt like I didn't exist even when I wasn't around him. I couldn't compete with the porn and I put up a boundary telling him he had he could choose to watch porn or choose to have intimate relationships with me, but he couldn't have both. He chose me and even though he stopped watching porn, he would seek out the other erotica to replace porn. And when I told him erotica still counted as porn, he was mad but stopped. Now he is trying to trigger shame and guilt because I still have my boundaries because he refuses to acknowledge his behavior. And I have no guarantee he won't revert back to old behavior. He also calls my boundaries demands. Sometimes um, have a hard time taking that guilt and would like to hear about letting his emotions stay with him. Yeah. Um, another really great question, uh, you know, very vivid picture of what that has looked like with the emotional interchange there. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, it really sticks out to me. Um, he's trying to trigger shame and guilt. Um, I don't know where this fits in the pantheon of mental health, but for me, it's helped a lot to be to recognize that my shame and guilt are mine. They don't belong to anybody else. And if I'm going to feel shame and guilt, it's because I choose to feel that I choose to let that in. And the reason why I let it in now is because it can be really corrective. It can help me to, it can help me to back up from the unhelpful interaction I'm doing in the relationship and, and take a more helpful approach. Um, but it's got to be me in the driver's seat of that. Um, if I've given the power of me to feel shame over to another person, um, the power for the other person to point out all of my flaws and to tell me what I needed to do, um, that's a really toxic shame. Um, the shame or the guilt that I can look back on and say, I'm feeling this because I did this or I didn't do that. That's really useful for me. So, you know, that, that could be one way to let the emotions stay with the person. Um, 
in, in a lot of the work I do with couples, there's times that I'll pause them and I'll say, I want you to see if you can tune out the tone and just listen to the words that are being said. Um, and this would be one of those if, if uh, you know, your, your husband is raising some complaints with you, the tone may be, you should feel awful about this and I'm such a victim. If you tune that out and you look at the words, do you agree with the words? And if not, then there's not really much there that you're going to need to look at. There's not really much there that you're going to need to change. Um, if you look at the words and, you know, this, this is not in this example, but, um, you know, in, in another instance, I've worked with couples who um, one, one partner would be really triggered by the tone of voice um, in asking a question or the tone of voice in asking for some accountability. Um, and when, when I've gotten them to a responsible place and the one who's hurt can say, hey, just when you use it in that tone, it makes me feel so little, it makes me feel small, and it makes me feel like you're really angry at me. Um, instead of in this, like, you always say it like this and you're always nagging me, like, that's the kind of stuff that we can't take on. But when we get into that, what's my behavior? If there's things that you want to change, go ahead and change them. If there's things you're looking at and, and you're saying, I can't change this one because my values are in conflict with that, or I can't tolerate a relationship like this, then, you know, don't, don't change it. Um, your guilt and your shame are yours to, to utilize as you would like to. Um, I think another part of letting his emotions stay with him is recognizing that um, a lot of times really intense, aggressive emotional communication is about an underlying fear and an underlying vulnerability that that person is not accepting. You know, so in cases where I've worked with couples like very similar to this before, where we'll just, we'll follow the gender lines here, where he really wants what he really wants is not to lose the relationship because he's terrified of being alone but he can't come out and say i'm really afraid that you've had enough of me and that our relationship is over because of my behavior that's too vulnerable for him so what he does instead is he threatens he coerces he manipulates um and so sometimes letting the emotion stay with the other person means recognizing that person person is coming from a very scared and vulnerable place and what they're doing on top of that, the coercion, the manipulation, the anger, that's all bluster. Um, that's, all, that's all manipulation, which manipulation means getting what I want without having to ask for it. You know, so internally being able to say, he's asking me to stay engaged. He wants me to stay engaged, but he's not asking for it. He has a responsibility to ask me to stay engaged. He has a responsibility to let me know how important this connection is to him. Um, and if he's not able to do that, like we, we can't mind read for our partner, no matter how much we may love them or how much we can see they're in pain. So part of that distancing or part of letting the emotions stay there is recognizing that your partner may have a skill set they need to develop that they haven't yet. And framing it like that, I think, makes it less about whether you're right or wrong and more about what is this person not bringing to the table that would really help them to alleviate some suffering. Uh, good answer. So, um, and we are basically out of time. So I think we're going to say thank you to all of you that came today and asked questions. And John, thank you as always for a great topic. And now that you've got the whole year planned, I can't wait to see what the whole year brings. It'll be yeah, informative series, no doubt. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you next week. Bye.